It is not unreasonable to look forward to a time when we will see without eyes, hear without ears, and talk without tongues. Briefly, the hypothesis that mind can communicate directly with mind rests on the theory that thought or vital force is a form of electrical disturbance. That it can be taken up by induction and transmitted to a distance either through a wire or simply through the all-pervading ether, as in the case of wireless telegraph waves. They are many analogies which suggest that thought is of a nature of an electrical disturbance. A nerve, which is on the same substance as the brain, is an excellent conductor of the electrical current. When we first passed an electrical current through the nerves of a dead man, we were shocked and amazed to see him sit up and move. The electrified nerves produced contraction of the muscles very much as in life. The nerves appear to act upon the muscles very much as the electric current acts upon electromagnet. The current magnetizes a bar of iron placed at right angles to it, and the nerve produces through the intangible current of vital force that flows through them, contraction of the muscular fibers that are arranged at right angles to them. It would be possible to cite many reasons why thought and vital force may be regarded as the same nature as electricity. The electric current is held to be a wave motion of the ether, the hypothetical substance that fills all space and pervades all substances. We believe that there must be ether because without it the electric current could not pass through a vacuum or sunlight through space. It is reasonable to believe that only a wave motion of a similar character can produce the phenomena of thought and vital force. We may assume that the brain cells act as a battery and that the current produced flows along the nerves. But does it end there? Does it not pass out of the body in waves which flow around the world unperceived by our senses, just as the wireless waves passed unperceived before Hertz and others discovered their existence? Every mind both a broadcasting and a receiving station. This author has proved, times too numerous to enumerate, to his own satisfaction at least, that every human brain is both a broadcasting and a receiving station for vibrations of thought frequency. If this theory should turn out to be a fact and methods of reasonable control should be established, imagine the part it would play in the gathering, classifying, and organizing of knowledge. The possibility, much less the probability, of such a reality staggers the mind of man. Thomas Paine was one of the great minds of the American Revolutionary period. To him more, perhaps, than any other one person, we owe both the beginning and the happy ending of the Revolution. For it was his keen mind that both helped in drawing up the Declaration of Independence and in persuading the signers of that document to translate it into terms of reality. In speaking of the source of his great storehouse of knowledge, Paine thus described it. Any person who has made observations on the state of progress of the human mind by observing his own cannot but have observed that there are two distinct classes of what are called thoughts, those that we produce in ourselves by reflection and the act of thinking, and those that bolt into the mind of their own accord. I have always made it a rule to treat these voluntary visitors with civility, taking care to examine, as well I was able, if they were worth entertaining. And it is from them I have acquired almost all the knowledge that I have. As to the learning that any person gains from school education, it serves only like a small capital to put him in the way of beginning learning for himself afterwards. Every person of learning is finally his own teacher. The reason for which is that principles cannot be impressed upon the memory. Their place of mental residence is the understanding, and they are never so lasting as when they begin by conception. In the foregoing words, Paine, the great American patriot and philosopher, described an experience which at one time or another is the experience of every person. Who is there so unfortunate as not to have received positive evidence that thoughts and even complete ideas will pop into the mind from outside sources? What means of conveyance is there for such visitors except the ether? Ether fills the boundless space of the universe. It is the medium of conveyance for all known forms of vibration such as sound, 
light and heat, why should it not be also the medium of conveyance of the vibration of thought? Every mind or brain is directly connected with every other brain by means of the ether. Every thought released by any brain may be instantly picked up and interpreted by all other brains that are in rapport with the sending brain. This author is as sure as his fact as he is that the chemical formula H2O will produce water. Imagine if you can what a part this principle plays in every walk of life. Nor is the probability of ether being a conveyor of thought from mind to mind the most astonishing of its performance. It is the belief of this author that every thought vibration released by any brain is picked up by the ether and kept in motion in circuitous wavelengths corresponding in length to the intensity of the energy used in their release. That these vibrations remain in motion forever. That they are one of the two sources from which thoughts which pop into one's mind emanate. The other source being direct and immediate contact to the ether with the brain releasing the thought vibration. Thus it will be seen that if this theory is a fact, the boundless space of the whole universe is now and will continue to become literally a mental library wherein may be found all the thoughts released by mankind. The author is here laying the foundation for one of the most important hypotheses enumerated in the lesson self-confidence a fact which the student should keep in mind as he approaches that lesson. This is a lesson on organized knowledge. Most of the useful knowledge to which the human race has become hare has become preserved and accurately recorded in nature's Bible. By turning back the pages of this unalterable Bible man has read the story of, the terrific struggle through and out of which the present civilization has grown. The pages of this Bible are made up of the physical elements of which this earth and other planets consist, and of the ether which fills the space. By turning back the pages written on stone and covered near the surface of this earth on which he lives, man has uncovered the bones, skeletons, footprints, and other unmistakable evidence of the history of animal life on this earth, planted there for his enlightenment and guidance by the hand of Mother Nature throughout unbelievable periods of time. The evidence is plain and unmistakable. The great stone pages of nature's Bible found on this earth and the endless pages of that Bible represented by the ether, wherein all past human thought has been recorded, constitute an authentic source of communication between the Creator and man. This Bible has begun before man had reached the thinking stage, indeed before man had reached the amoeba stage of development. This Bible is above and beyond the power of man to alter. Moreover, it tells its story, not in the ancient dead languages or hieroglyphics of half-savage races, but in universal language, which all have eyes may read. Nature's Bible, from which we have derived all the knowledge that is worth knowing, is one that no man may alter or in any manner tamper with. The most marvelous discovery yet made by man is that of the recently discovered radio principle, which operates through the aid of ether, an important portion of nature's Bible. Imagine the ether picking up the ordinary vibration of sound and transforming that vibration from audio frequency into radio frequency, carrying it to a properly attuned receiving station and then transforming it back into its original form of audio frequency, all in the flash of a second. It should surprise no one that such a force could gather up the vibration of thought and keep that vibration in motion forever. The established and known fact of instantaneous transmission of sound through the agency of the ether by means of the modern radio apparatus removes the theory of transmission of thought vibration from mind to mind, from the possible to the probable. The master mind, we come now to the next step in the description of the ways and means by which one may gather, classify and organize useful knowledge. Through harmonious alliance of two or more minds, out of which grows a master mind. The term master mind is abstract and has no counterpart in the field of known facts, except to a small number of people who have made a careful study of the effect of one mind upon other minds. 
This author has searched in vain through all the textbook and essays available on the subject of the human mind, but nowhere has been able to find even the slightest reference to the principle here described as the mastermind. The term first came to the attention of the author through an interview with Andrew Carnegie in the manner described in Lesson 2. Chemistry of the Mind It is this author's belief that the mind is made up of the same universal fluid energy as that which constitutes the ether which fills the universe. It is a fact as well known to the layman as to the man of scientific investigation that some minds clash the moment they come in contact with each other, while other minds show a natural affinity for each other. Between the two extremes of natural antagonism and natural affinity growing out of the meeting or contacting of minds, there is a wide range of possibilities for varying reactions of mind upon mind. Some minds are so naturally adapted to each other that love at first sight is the inevitable outcome of the contact. Who has not known of such an experience? In other cases, minds are so antagonistic that violent mutual dislike shows itself at first meeting. These results occur without a word being spoken and without the slightest signs of any of the usual causes for love and hate acting as a stimulus. It is quite probable that the mind is made up of a fluid or substance or energy, call it what you will, similar to, if not in fact the same substance as, the ether. When two minds come close enough to each other to form a contact, the mixing of the units of this mind stuff, let us call it the electrons of the ether, sets up a chemical reaction and starts vibrations which affect the two individuals pleasantly or unpleasantly. The effect of the meeting of two minds is obvious to even the most casual observer. Every effect must have a cause. What could be more reasonable than to suspect that the cause of the change in mental attitude between two minds, which have just come in close contact, is none other than the disturbance of electrons or units of each mind in the process of rearranging themselves in the new field created by that contact. For the purpose of establishing this lesson upon a sound foundation, we have gone a long way toward success by admitting that the meeting or coming in close contact of two minds sets up in each of those minds a certain noticeable effect or state of mind quite different from the one existing immediately prior to contract. While it is desirable, it is not essential to know what is the cause of this reaction of every mind upon mind. That the reaction takes place in every instance is a known fact which gives us a starting point from which we may show what is meant by the term mastermind. A mastermind may be created through the bringing together or blending in a spirit of perfect harmony of two or more minds. Out of this harmonious blending the chemistry of the mind creates a third mind which may be appropriated and used by one or all of the individual minds. This mastermind will remain available as long as the friendly, harmonious alliance between the individual minds exists. It will disintegrate and all the evidence of its former existence will disappear the moment the friendly alliance is broken. This principle of mind chemistry is the basis and cause for practically all the so-called soulmate and eternal triangle cases, so many of which unfortunately find their way into the divorce courts and meet with popular ridicule from ignorant and uneducated people who manufacture vulgarity and scandal out of one of the greatest of nature's laws. The entire civilized world knows that the first two or three years of association after marriage are less often marked by much disagreement, of a more or less petty nature. These are the years of adjustment. If the marriage survives them, it is more than apt to become a permanent alliance. These facts no experienced married person will deny. Again we see the effect without understanding the cause. While there are other contributing causes yet in the main, lack of harmony during these early years of marriage is due to the slowness of the chemistry of the minds in blending harmoniously. Stated differently, the electrons or units of the energy called the mind are often neither extremely friendly nor antagonistic upon first contact but through constant association they gradually adapt themselves in harmony 
except in rare cases where association has the opposite effect of leading eventually to open hostility between these units. It is a well-known fact that after a man and a woman have lived together for 10 to 15 years, they become practically indistinguishable to each other. Even though there may not be the slightest evidence of the state of mind called love, moreover, this association and relationship sexually not only develops a natural affinity between the two minds, but it actually causes the two people to take on a similar facial expression and to resemble each other closely in many other marked ways. Any competent analysis of human nature can easily go into a crowd of strange people and pick out the wife after having been introduced to her husband. The expression of the eyes, the contour of the faces and the tone of the voice of people who have long been associated in marriage become similar to a marked degree. So marked is the effect of the chemistry of the human mind that any experienced public speaker may quickly interpret the manner in which his statements are accepted by his audience. Antagonism in the mind of but one person in an audience of 1,000 may be readily detected by the speaker who has learned how to feel and register the effects of antagonism. Moreover, the public speaker can make these interpretations without observing or in any manner being influenced by the expression on the faces of those in his audience. On account of these facts, an audience may cause a speaker to rise to great heights of oratory or heckle him into failure without making a sound or denoting a single expression of satisfaction or dissatisfaction through the features of the face. All master salesmen know the moment the psychological time for closing has arrived. Not by what the prospective buyer says, but from the effect of the chemistry of his mind is interpreted or felt by the salesman. Words often belie the intentions of those speaking them, but a correct interpretation of the chemistry of the mind leaves no loophole for such a possibility. Every able salesman knows that the majority of buyers have the habit of affecting a negative attitude almost to the very climax of the sale. Every able lawyer has developed a sixth sense whereby he is unable to feel his way through the most artfully selected words of the clever witness who is lying and correctly interpret that which is in the witness's mind through the chemistry of the mind. Many lawyers have developed this ability without knowing the real source of it. They possess the technique without the scientific understanding upon which it is based. Many salesmen have done the same thing. One who is gifted in the art of correctly judging the chemistry of the minds of others may, figuratively speaking, walk in at the front door of the mansion of a given mind and leisurely explore the entire building noting all its details, walking out again with a complete picture of the interior of the building, without the owner of the building so much as knowing that he has been entertained a visitor. It will be observed in the lesson Accurate Thinking that this principle may be put to a very practical use, having reference to the principle of the chemistry of the mind. The principle is referred to merely as an approach to the major principles of this lesson. Enough has already been stated to introduce the principle of mind's chemistry and to prove with the aid of the student's own everyday experience and the casual observation that the moment two minds come within close range of each other, a noticeable mental change takes place in both. Sometimes registering in the nature of antagonism and the other times registering in the nature of friendliness. Every mind has what might be termed an electrical field. The nature of this field varies depending upon the mood of the individual's mind back of it and upon the nature of the chemistry of the mind creating the field. It is believed by this author that the normal or natural condition of the chemistry of any individual mind is the result of his physical hereditary plus the nature of thoughts which have dominated that mind. That every mind is continuously changing to the extent that the individual's philosophy and general habits of thought change the chemistry of his or own mind. These principle the author believes to be true. That any individual may voluntarily change the chemistry of his or own mind so that it will be either attract or repel all with whom it comes in contact is a known fact. Stated in another manner, 
Any person may assume a mental attitude which will attract and please others or repel and antagonize them, and this without the aid of words or facial expression or other form of bodily movement or demeanor.